This is another very long presentation of four slides. So, uh, this article is, uh, and it's all the things that are all justified and explained. I think it's 13 pages or something. And it's sort of, from my perspective, a swan song of writing a thousand articles about HP uh, machines and so forth. And it's all covered in detail. It's on your thumb drive if you're interested in reading it. And I was a little bit concerned about making such a statement, if you wish. But those of you who were attending last year have a pretty good idea of uh, it's not an outrageous thing at all. And so um, the idea that you, that you have a new technology and you are a editor reporting on that technology and you see the technology rise to its peak and fall and then finally come to the end. And the details of, of what is the end, how do you define the end, and uh, what the end means, it's all, I try to all spell that out. But another objective I had in writing the article was that five years from now, ten years from now, if somebody came across this article, they would have links and pointers to various aspects of uh, the history of HP calculators in a you know, very condensed form. So 1972 is, of course, the um, HP 35, right over here, not very clear. And of course, the last machine they produced, the design that produces this year, uh, this is given the year. This, of course, was three years ago, four, what was the year for the six, prime? Six years ago. November. 2013. 13? Oh, three. Wow. Really? Mm -hmm. Where's the time gone? Uh, it was fun. So that's it. Um, of course, when I put it on the website, I, I would I presume that most people would, would, would think I was thinking of this is the end of the of the conferences. I don't know. I, I, I made it ambiguous like everybody does. And many of you may have seen this photograph before. When I moved from Southern California to the Phoenix area in 2007, I, I had for 10 years all my calculator stuff stored and part of that storage was uh, uh, some boxes that went after I moved, it was like 18,000 pounds in a semi that I, had, I moved. And I unpacked stuff, but certain things I didn't unpack, and this is stuff I haven't unpacked, uh, like for example this is says EDUCAP office on here and uh, um, uh, some of them are sort of labeled but a lot of this material is, is letters and correspondence that I was able to retrieve from the dumpster outside of PPC offices when Emmett was cleaning house. And my emotional issue is what do I do with this stuff? Now, I even can't even get to it because this has been there for 12 years, right? So there's tables here and there's, you know, that's my electronics part sorting project is in that area. That's my, this is part of my laundry room area. So one of the issues I have is, well, number one, I have to go through all this material. I just can't rent me a, a dumpster, which is I'm going to do sooner or later in the next few months, and just chuck everything. I need to go through there in case there's something that's really valuable. Um, maybe it's an unpublished uh, internal document from HP. Uh, maybe it's a historical letter or something. But my thoughts have been, since I have been in a very unusual and unique position with regards to being a, an outsider to HP, but yet being very close to HP. And in this article, which has no title, it's called RIP for lack of anything, 
uh, in there I lay all this out. And, and I've been in a relation with HP, I, I call four levels of uh, involvement with HP. You know, one is a customer, and I think level four was as a consultant. So I'm thinking that I have an unusual perspective, and with this and, and another room of documents that I have, I can I can write a book and be able to document the dates and names and places and people and all that stuff that's involved over the years. Because I've had some not previously published interactions with HP. And in fact, in the early days, we had a meeting in Oregon, and Jake will remember this, where HP, we were the guest of HP, and a picnic on, on, on their property, on their yard. And they gave us a, a tour of the factory. And we could see the ink jet printer cartridges, how they were made, and we could see all of the assembly of the machines. This is back, you know, in the days when it was done here in the U.S. And one of the things they did is they asked a lot of HP employees to be, this on a Saturday, was it Saturday or Sunday, Jake? I don't remember. I forget. Probably yeah. Saturday. Yeah. So they took us in groups as a tour of, of the factory. Well, my God, we're, we're going to go through the factory. Look at every wall. Look at everything that's to be seen. If nobody's looking, sneak under the table. You know, I mean, it was like uh, uh, ants on, on, a, on a big ball of honey or something. So um, they had every aisle an HP employee standing there to make sure this group, nobody snuck off in this group, and they weren't in, in, in private areas or, or whatever. It was, it, was, it was an interesting thing to watch. But for me, it was an unusual uh, event in cooperation with HP. So many of these over the last, I don't know, 40 years or 38 years, whatever it is, 19, June 1974 to now, how many years is that? So I feel that I can't just throw this out without treating it with the respect, in my viewpoint, of the people who sent it to me had, all right? In many ways, they trusted it to me. And there are many, many things, for example, um, uh, PPC used to have a phone bulletin. And while some of the phone bulletin, audio phone bulletins have been recovered, and our, our Eric has them, uh, from EduCalc, the ones from PPC, and I can't say they're totally lost because I still have the answering machine, and I still have a lot of tapes, so that may be something to recover. But the, there was a famous one about a poem. Who does not know or remember the HP poem? Oh, Joey, you, you have to be in that camp, right? <laughs> okay. But we had an answering machine that when you called it, you would hear three, 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 this is Richard Nelson with your PPC phone bulls and number three, and then whatever the news. A member of PPC, I guess enough years have passed, I can be a little more specific. I don't want anybody to be in trouble, although the whole factory's gone, so who knows, who cares. But he worked in an advertising agency, and he was a calculator user. And HP came in there to have a campaign for a new series of machines, and they brought in all kinds of, uh, oh, they had, uh, not bumper stickers, but they had all kinds of stuff that they had printed up and they had given to this agency. Well, somehow that found into my hands and I had the whole family of unannounced calculators, I knew quite a bit about them. And that's what the poem was about. The poem was using the, um, um, what do we call the names? Code names. Code names for all these calculators. 
And the phone bulletin was up with this poem on it, and HP went through the roof. <laughs> and the first thing they did was haul Henry Horn into it and said, Henry Horn, what have you been telling Richard? And of course, Henry said, I won't tell him Richard anything. And, and I think the phone bulletin was up at the most six or seven hours. I think I put it up in the morning. I got a call from HP about two and a half hours later. And then I started calling, you know, I called Henry, and that's how I knew about that part of it. And uh, they wanted to know where I got this information because it was it was the absolute top secret super nobody knows this and how does this guy know about it? and not only that he's putting on a phone bill. Well of course I wasn't going to divulge the source but I thought about it after about five hours I just took it took it off. So there's a long number of interactions with HP that I've had that are unusual. And of course there's the relationship of HP and PPC in terms of how we uh, handle things. So this article, uh, called RIP, documents some of that. And one of the achievements, if you wish, is that when the 41 was the big machine, we were struggling club trying to reach self-sustaining mass, which we never really did. We got to 5,000 members and that was about it. Uh, 160 countries or something like that, and chapters all around the world. We, we did, in the, in the payday, reach a certain level of accomplishment, if you wish. And uh, where was I? my point on this one. You were going to talk about the card in the box. Oh, yes, yes. So, after a lot of, many months of negotiation, I was trying to talk Hewlett Packard to put a, a, an advertisement for the club in the box of each calculator. And we finally came to an agreement. I would write the text, HP would approve it, it would be printed uh, to HP standards, and the best way to guarantee that would be to use an HP uh, printer that they dealt with at new HP standards up in Corvallis. They would tell me how many to print, I would pay the printer to print, the printer would deliver them to the HP, and HP would then take them, I think there's still there's some of that stuff off, offshore at that time, uh, not in China like it is today, but uh, they, they were making, doing some stuff uh, offshore. And there was this car, like a, it was a, like a Christmas car, folded in half, and it was in color, two colors. And um, so the first batch was printed, I think the second batch was printed, and, 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 and it was a revision, and, and all of this is on your thumb drive, so if I remember some of the details wrong, it's, it's, it's correct there. Emma Ingram was able to take over control of PPC, and I started to chew, and right away we have two user groups going head to head. Now I wasn't concerned, because, well, I knew Emmett quite well, uh, as time went on, the rest of the world came to know Emmett for what he really was. And so I revised the text, listing, you know, being neutral, listing both groups, and I submitted it to HP. And HP forwarded it to Emmett, and Emmett said, no, I'm not going to change the card. Well, HP, that, that put HP in a bad spot. And um, Bill Wicks was uh, in involved in this a little bit. And finally, it finally came to a point where 
I think it was Bill Wicks who HP ticked him off for one reason or another, and they went back to the uh, text. Now, I had moved since then, so the address had changed. And so there were four versions of the card in the box, and I think there were two different colors used. All of the photographs and all the text is one of the appendices of the article that I'm describing for you. So it's, 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 there's a large number of uh, experiences that I have in working with HP because this activity right here, right here and now, this is the oldest running, continuous, computer type user group activity, period. And it happens to be with the largest technology company on the planet. So that's, 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 that's something, you know, and, and we existed from beginning to end. And that's, that's, that says something. And because of that, I have promised myself I'm going to make a decision by the end of this month. Do I write the book or not? If I write the book, I'm going to not, I, I, don't, I will not liquidate all my calculator stuff. If I decide not to write the book, then I will delay that because I will need that if I'm going to write the book. And it's a two-year project. It, it, it'll be a two-year project. I have to go through all of these. I have to go through a lot of other material I have because we want to have dates and times and people and so forth. There was one experience I had. I've only had two such experiences in my life. And one of them was with HP. The other one was with a religious group that, that I kind of worked for the church on a project in, in one of the southern islands in the Philippines. And I was the technical director for an educational TV system that we were going to broadcast TV programs for teachers in the barrios and we were going to make TV sets and generators and we would bring a generator and a TV to this barrio and we would broadcast uh, lessons to increase the um, literacy uh, in that area of the Philippines. So I was working for this uh, religious group and I, after nine months or so, uh, I realized that I was, I was the only foreign person there and they would have their board meetings and I would sit in on the board meeting, I'd be very quiet, what have you, and they would discuss what they're going to do and so on. But every time I got involved into the technical arena, that was my responsibility. I was the technical director. And after about nine months, I realized I signed up, I guarantee three years for this project, but at this rate, it ain't gonna happen. And so it's costing me money to be there. And I said, I'm sorry, I, I, I have to, I have to resign. The head of that group was a, a Filipino American trained lawyer, very wealthy man who owned a sugar plantation. And he had a, a nice building there and, and offices and so forth, a very wealthy man. And so I had, to, he was the director, so I had to turn my resignation into him. And he was not a happy camper. And for two hours, he used every psychological browbeating technique you could ever think about and, and trying to shame me into giving up and not resign. And I thought long and hard. In fact, I went to the, to the local uh, 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 cardinal at the church in that area to talk to him. And uh, I said, look, I just, I came here to do a job, and I, I'm, and I don't mind fighting the local customs and the laws and all of that. For example, I had to get a 10 kilowatt generator down to the port of Manila, so I had to fly down to Manila, and the port was, uh, had a big strike, so I had to cross the strike lines and, and get that generator and get it on a ship back and then I had to get it to our facility and then I had to get up in the mountains because the channel 10 transmitter was up in the mountains and, and so I had to, I had to do those things 
and I couldn't do it with my hands tied by the board. They wanted to paint the building. You know, okay. The board would discuss it for three months. I painted the building in a week. I just went and did it. So, you know, the difference of, of thought. Anyway, that experience was similar to the experience I had with HP. One of the things the club did was we got uh, ROMs, HP ROMs, we copied them and we burned them into EPROMs. Remember those days? Yeah. Um, it was one ROM, was it? I don't remember if it was the extended functions ROM or what it was. But somebody at HP sent me the ROM. I didn't have the ability to copy it, so I immediately sent it to Jim Diaz. Jim Diaz copied it, and he sent it back to me. Like I always did, the moment I had the ROM in my hands, hello HP, I've got this ROM. And because I was always open and straightforward with them. And they didn't like that, they were very unhappy. Where, where'd you get it? How'd you get it? Who gave it to you? So, I went up to HP, this is Santa Ana, up to Corvallis. They brought me into a room and they had two or three people and they beat on me like that sugar baron beat on me. And finally, after all of this philosophical discussion, the bottom line was, Richard, did it ever occur to you to return HP property to us? They had me. <laughs> no, I mean, what? <laughs> so I said, okay, I will return it. But I will not tell you who sent it to me. They didn't like that, but they were happy that I was going to return it. Once that issue was solved, we then proceeded to talk about, well, what really, what is the heart of the problem here? And it was a wonderful thing. They had revised their policy and they said, okay, we, we, we HP will give PPC card blanche in doing this, 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 and this. So we could copy their ROMs and burn eight ROMs to our heart's content. So the end result was a very positive thing. So I took the ROM and I sent it to somebody else up in Corvallis. I said, would you please deliver this to HP? I called HP and I said, the ROM will be delivered, you know, at 10 o'clock at the front desk. And it was delivered at 10 minutes to 10, of course, so they didn't see who brought it in there. <laughs> and the HP's property was returned to HP. We had the image. We circulated the image amongst the interested members who burned the EPROMs. And eventually the ROM was reduced to the public and, and all as well. So there's a number of stories like this that might be interesting reading for people who are interested in HP calculators. And the book would be something like, the title might be, How a User Group Can Network with the Manufacturer. It would be um, a, that broad thing. It wouldn't be you know, necessarily a history of calculators or the user's view of, cal of calculators, anything like that. There'd be all of that in there, but it would be written with a broader emphasis of usefulness. So, any of you who have uh, ideas, suggestions, or what have you, I'd like to hear them before the end of the conference. Question back there. Yeah, I was thinking uh, about your archive here and Eric's work. Um, have EduCalc catalogs been archived? Oh, yeah. Oh. You've got them all. Got them all. Oh, yeah, yeah. When EduCalc went out of business, I was the last employee. And I think the, I don't remember the exact date, but it's all historically documented. The, the doors of a business, that's not the end. If you're running the building, you've got to vacate the building. And EduCalc had been in three units of this eight-unit building. One, which he's going to keep. The other two, he was going to give up because he was going out of business. Um, we had to sweep up the warehouse and clean it up. I worked. I worked physically for a week, but 
everything that was left, Richard took home. There were boxes that I took home that I never even saw until I moved to Arizona and opened them up. Oh, another story. When HP moved, they moved out of Corvallis. Where'd they go out of Corvallis? Jake, remember? Singapore. They, they went to Singapore. Yeah, Singapore, right. But they've got a lot of stuff. So I get a call from HP. They said, well, Richard, you know, we've got some stuff left over. Would you like to have it? Really? You're giving a man in the desert who hasn't drank for two days if he wants a drink of water? Of course I want it. Well, um, well, well, we'll send it to you, but we need to have a place to receive it. I said, well, is it that much? He says, yeah, it's, 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 it's substantial. Okay. I went to Jim. I said, Jim, I need a part of your warehouse. <laughs> HP's going to send me some material. So the day came, the 18-wheeler drove up, and they unloaded it. And Jim came out, and he looked, and he said, holy crap, HP sent you this? It was 11 pallets of stuff, primarily manuals. Much of it has been on the table, on the door prize table over the last 10 years. Okay. I think that's what I wanted. Was there some, oh, yeah, there's one other thing I want to do. Let's see what we got here. I don't remember. Oh, discussion time. We've had that. <laughs>